Cosmology and Modern Science by Titus Burkhardt. In the book, The Sword of Gnosis, Metaphysics, Cosmology, Tradition, Symbolism. Part 1. In what follows, attention will be drawn to certain gaps in modern science, and these will be judged by means of the criteria provided by cosmology in the traditional sense of that term. We know that the Greek word cosmos means order, implying the ideas of unity and totality. Cosmology is thus the science of the world inasmuch as it reflects its unique cause being. This reflection of the uncreated in the created necessarily presents itself under diverse aspects, and even under an indefinite variety of aspects, each of which has about it something whole and total, so that there are a multiplicity of visions of the cosmos, all equally possible and legitimate, and springing from the same universal and immutable principles. These principles, by reason of their very universality, are essentially inherent in human intelligence at its most profound. But this pure intellect becomes disengaged, generally speaking, and for the man who is predisposed thereunto, only with the aid of the supernatural elements that an authentic and complete spiritual tradition alone can supply. That is to say, all genuine cosmology is attached to a divine revelation, even if the object considered and the mode of its expression are situated apparently outside the message this revelation brings. Such is the case, for instance, with Christian cosmology, the origin of which appears at first sight somewhat heterogeneous, since it refers on the one hand to the biblical account of creation, even while being based, on the other hand, on the heritage of the Greek cosmologists. If there seems to be a certain eclecticism here, it should be stressed that this is providential, since the two sources in question complement one another in a harmonious way, the first being presented in the form of a myth, and the other the form of a doctrine expressed in comparatively rational terms, one that is therefore neutral from the viewpoint of symbolism and of the spiritual perspective. Moreover, there can only be question of a syncretism where there is a mixture, hence confusion, of planes and modes of expression. Now, the biblical myth of the creation and the Greek cosmology do not present any formally incompatible perspectives, nor do they duplicate one another, as would be the case if one attempted a mingling of Buddhist cosmology, for example, with the figurative teaching of the Bible. The biblical myth assumes the form of a drama, a divine action that appears to unfold in time, distinguishing the principal and the relative by a before and after. Greek cosmology, of part, corresponds to an essentially static vision of things. It depicts the structure of the world, such as it is, as now and always, as a hierarchy of degrees of existence, of which the lower stages are conditioned by time, space, and number, while the superior degrees are situated beyond temporal succession and spatial or other limits. This doctrine thus presents itself quite naturally and providentially as a scientific commentary on the scriptural symbolism. The biblical myth is revealed, but neither is the Greek cosmology of purely human origin. Even with Aristotle, that distant founder of Western rationalism, certain basic ideas, like his distinction between form and matter, for example, undoubtedly sprang from a knowledge that is supra-rational and therefore timeless and sacred. Aristotle translates this wisdom into a homogeneous dialectic. His dialectic is valid because the law inherent in thought reflects its own way the law of existence. At the same time, he demonstrates reality only in such measure as it is able to be logically determined. Plato and Plotinus go much further. They reach beyond the objectivized cosmology of Aristotle, restoring to symbolism all its super-rational significance. 
Christian cosmology borrowed the analytical thought of Aristotle, but it is from Plato that it drew the doctrine of archetypes that vindicates symbolism and confirms the primacy of intellectual intuition over discursive thought. The keystone of all Christian cosmology and the crucial element that renders possible the fusing of the biblical myth with the Greek heritage is the evangelical doctrine of the Logos as source of both existence and knowledge. This doctrine, which in itself exceeds the plane of cosmology, the Gospels contain hardly any cosmological elements, constitutes nonetheless its spiritual axis. It is through this doctrine that the science of the created is connected with the knowledge of the uncreated. It is thus through its link with metaphysics, comprised in this case in the Johannine doctrine of the world, that cosmology is reconciled with theology before becoming an ancilla theologiae, it is an extension of gnosis. The same might be said of all traditional cosmologies, and in particular, those belonging to Islam and Judaism. Their immutable axis will always be a revealed doctrine of the spirit or intellect, whether the latter be conceived as uncreated, as in the case of the word, or as created, as with the primary intellect, or as having two aspects, the one created and the other uncreated. We know that there were frequent exchanges between the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish cosmologists, and the same certainly occurred between the Hellenistic cosmologists and certain Asiatic civilizations. But it goes without saying, as Ganon pointed out, that generally speaking, the traditional cosmologies have no kinship with historical borrowings, for in the first place there is the nature of things, and, after that, there is intuitive knowledge. This knowledge, as we have said, must be vivified by a sacred science, the written and oral repository of a divine revelation. Be that as it may, all is contained definitively in our own soul, whose lower ramifications are identified with the realm of the senses, but whose root reaches up to pure being in the supreme essence, so that man grasps in himself the axis of the cosmos. He can measure its whole vertical dimension, and in this respect his knowledge of the world can be adequate in spite of the fact that he will necessarily be ignorant of much, or even nearly all, of its horizontal extension. It is thus perfectly possible for traditional cosmology to convey, as it does, a knowledge that is real and incomparably vaster and more profound than that offered by the modern empirical sciences, even while entertaining childish or more precisely human opinions about realities of the physical order. Western cosmology fell out of favor from the moment when the ancient geocentric system of the world was replaced by the heliocentric system of Copernicus. For that to be possible, cosmology had to be reduced to cosmography alone. Thus, the form was confused with the content, and the one was rejected with the other. In reality, the medieval conception of the physical world, of its ordinance and its extension, did not correspond only to a natural and therefore realistic vision of things. It expressed, at the same time, a spiritual order in which man has his organic place. Let us pause for a moment at this vision of the world, known to us particularly through the poetic works of Dante. The planetary heaven and the heaven of the fixed stars that surrounds it were presented as so many concentric spheres, all the more vast inasmuch as they possess more virtue, as Dante explains, and of which the extreme limit, the invisible heaven of the Empyrean, is identified both with universal space and pure duration. Spatially, it represents a sphere of unlimited radius, and temporally, it is the background of all movement. Its continual rotation bears along with it all inferior movements, which are measured in relation to it, 
though it cannot itself be measured in an absolute way, since time cannot be divided except in reference to the marking out of a movement in space. These spheres symbolize the superior states of consciousness, and, more exactly, the modalities of the soul that, while still contained in the integral individuality, are more and more irritated by the divine spirit. It is the empyrean, the threshold between time and not time, that represents the extreme limit of the individual or formal world. It is in crossing this limit that Dante obtains a new vision, one that is to some extent inverse to the cosmic order. Up to that point, the hierarchy of existence, which goes from corporeal to spiritual, express itself through a gradual expansion of space the container being the cause and master of the contained. Now the divine being reveals itself as the center around which the angels revolve in ever closer and closer choirs. In reality, there is no symmetry between the two orders, planetary and angelic, for God is at one and the same time the center and container of all things. It is the physical order alone, that one of the starry firmament that represents the reflection of the superior order. As for the circles of hell, which Dante describes as a pit sunk into the earth as far as the point toward which all heaviness tends, they are not the inverse reflection, but the contrary of the celestial spheres. They are those spheres overturned, as it were, whereas the mountain of purgatory, which the poet tells us was formed from the earth cast up by Lucifer in the course of his fall toward the center of gravity, is, correctly speaking, a compensation for hell. By this localization of hell and purgatory, Dante did not intend to establish a geography. He was not deluded concerning the provisional character of the symbolism, although he obviously believed in the geocentric system of Ptolemy. The heliocentric system itself admits of an obvious symbolism, since it identifies the source of light with the center of the world. Its rediscovery by Copernicus, however, produced no new spiritual vision of the world. Rather, was it comparable to the dangerous popularization of an esoteric truth? The heliocentric system had no common measure with the subjective experiences of people, and it man had no organic place. Instead of helping the human mind go beyond itself and to consider things in terms of the immensity of the cosmos, it only encouraged a materialistic Prometheanism, which, far from being superhuman, ended by becoming inhuman. Strictly speaking, a modern cosmology does not exist, in spite of an abuse of language whereby the modern science of the sensible universe is called cosmology. In fact, the modern science of nature expressly limits itself to the corporeal domain alone, which it isolates from the total cosmos while considering things in their purely spatial and temporal phenomenality, as if suprasensible reality with its differing levels was nothing at all, and as if that reality were not knowable thanks to the intellect, in which it is analogically inherent in virtue of the correspondence between the macrocosm and the microcosm. But the point we wish to stress here is the following one. Scientism is an objective knowledge that would have itself mathematical and exclusive. By virtue of this fact, it behaves as if the human subject did not exist, or as if that subject were not a subtle mirror indispensable for the phenomenal appearing of the world. There is a deliberate ignoring of the fact that the subject is the guarantor of the logical continuity of the world, and also, by virtue of its intellectual essence, the witness of every objective reality. In fact, a knowledge that is objective, and therefore independent of particular subjectivities, definitely presupposes immutable criteria, and these could not exist if there were not, in the individual subject itself, an impartial background a witness transcending the individual, that is to say precisely, the intellect. After all, knowledge of the world presupposes the underlying unity of the knowing subject, so that one might say of a voluntarily agnostic science what Mr. Eckhart said of the atheists, the more they blaspheme God, the more they praise him. 
the more science affirms an exclusively objective order of things, the more it manifests the underlying unity of the spirit. It does this indirectly and unconsciously and in spite of itself. That is to say, contrary to its own thesis. But when it's all said and done, it proclaims in its own way that which it intends to deny. In the perspective of scientism, the total human subject, who is at the same time sensibility, reason, and intellect, is replaced by an illusory way by mathematical thought alone. According to a distinguished scientist of our century, all true progress of natural science resides in the fact that it disengages itself more and more from subjectivity, and that it brings out more and more clearly what exists independently of human conceiving, without troubling itself about the fact that the result has only a distant likeness to that which the original perception took for real. According to this declaration, which is considered authoritative, the subjectivity from which one is trying to break loose is not reducible to the intrusion of the sensorial accidents and emotional impulsions into the order of objective knowledge. It is the entire human conception of things, that is to say, both the direct perception by the senses and its spontaneous assimilation by the imagination, that is in question. Only mathematical thought is considered to be objective or true. The latter allows, in fact, a maximum of generalization while remaining linked to number, so that it can be verified on the quantitative plane. It does not, however, include the whole of reality as communicated to us through our senses. It affects a selection of that reality, and the scientific prejudice we have just been speaking of treats as unreal. It affects a selection of that reality, and the scientific prejudice we have just been speaking of treats as unreal all that this selection leaves out. Thus, it is that those sensible qualities, called secondary, such as colors, odors, savors, and sensations of hot and cold, are considered to be subjective impressions implying no objective quality or possessing no other reality than that which belongs to their indirect physical causes, as for example in the case of colors, to the various frequencies of the luminous waves. Once it be admitted that in principle the sensible qualities cannot as such be considered to be qualities of the things themselves, physics offers us an entirely sure and homogeneous system, one which answers all questions as to what really underlies those colors, sounds, temperatures, etc. What is this homogeneity but the result of a certain reduction of the qualitative aspects of nature to quantitative modalities? Modern science therefore asks us to sacrifice a good part of that which makes for us the reality of the world, and offers us an exchange mathematical schema of which the only advantage is to help us to manipulate matter on its own plane, which is that of quantity. The mathematical selection of reality does not only eliminate the secondary qualities of perception, it removes also what the Greek philosophers and scholastics called form. That is to say, the qualitative seal imprinted on matter by the unique essence of a being or a thing. For modern science, the essential form does not exist. Some rare Aristotelians, writes a theoretician of modern science, still perhaps think they can attain intuitively through some illumination by the active intellect, the essential ideas of the things of nature. But this is nothing but a lovely dream. The essence of things cannot be contemplated, they must be discovered by experience, by means of laborious work of investigation. To this, a Plytonus, an Ivicena, or a St. Albert the Great would answer that there is nothing more evident in nature than the essences of things, since these manifest themselves in the very forms, only these cannot be discovered by a laborious work of investigation, nor measured quantitatively. But the intuition that grasps them leans directly upon sensory perception and upon imagination inasmuch as the latter synthesizes the impressions received from the outside. Moreover, what is this human reason that tries to grasp the essence of things by a laborious work of investigation? 
Either this faculty of reason is truly capable of attaining its object, or it is not. Now, we know that reason is limited, but we also know that it is able to conceive truths that are independent of individuals, therefore that a universal law is manifested in it. If human intelligence is not merely organized matter, in which case it would not be intelligence, this means it necessarily participates in a transcendent principle. Without entering into philosophical discussions on the nature of reason, we can compare the relation existing between it and its supra-individual source, which medieval cosmology calls active intellect, and in a more general sense, first intellect, to the relation of a reflection to its luminous source, and this image will be at the same time more vast and more correct than any philosophical definition whatsoever. A reflection is always limited by the nature of its reflective plane. In the case of reason, this plane is the mind, and in a more general sense, the human psyche. But the nature of light remains essentially the same, in its source as in its reflection. The same applies to spirit, whatever may be the formal limits that a particular reflective plane lends to it. Now, spirit is essentially and wholly knowledge. In itself, it is subject to no foreign constraint, and nothing could in principle prevent it knowing itself and at the same time knowing all the possibilities contained in itself. Therein is to be found a means of access, not to the material structure of things in particular and in detail, but to their permanent essences. All truly cosmological knowledge is founded on the qualitative aspects of things, that is to say, on forms, and so far as these are marks of their essence. By this fact, cosmology is at the same time direct and speculative, for it grasps the qualities of things in a direct way, without calling them in question, and at the same time it disengages them from their particular attachments in order to consider them at their different levels of manifestation. The universe thus reveals its internal unity and shows at the same time a rainbow-hued variety of aspects and dimensions. Often this vision of things has something poetic about it, a fact that is evidently not to its detriment, since all genuine poetry comprises a presentiment of the essential harmony of the world. It is in this sense that Muhammad was able to say, Surely there is a part of wisdom in poetry. If reproach can be leveled at this vision of the world on the grounds that it is more contemplative than practical, and that it neglects the material connections of things, which in reality is hardly a reproach, it can be said, on the other hand, about scientism that it empties the world of all its qualitative sap. The traditional vision of things is above all static and vertical. It is static because it refers to constant and universal qualities, and it is vertical in the sense that it attaches the inferior to the superior, the immaterial to the imperishable. The modern vision, on the contrary, is basically dynamic and horizontal. It is not the symbolism of things that interests it, but their material and historical connections. The great argument in favor of the modern science of nature an argument that counts for a lot in the eyes of the crowd, whatever may be the reservations made by men of science themselves, it is technical applicability. This, so it is believed, proves the validity of scientific principles, as if a fragmentary and in some respects problematical efficacy were a proof of an intrinsic and total value. In reality, modern science displays a certain number of fissures that are not only due to the fact that the world of phenomena is a definite, and that therefore no science could come to the end of it. Those fissures derive especially from its systematic ignorance of all the non-corporeal dimensions of reality. They manifest themselves right down to the foundations of modern science, and in domains seemingly as exact as that of physics. They become gaping cracks when one turns to the disciplines connected with the study of the forms of life, not to mention psychology, where an empiricism that is relatively valid in the physical order encroaches strangely upon a foreign field.
These fissures, which do not affect only the theoretical realm, are far from harmless. They represent, on the contrary, in their technical consequences, so many seeds of catastrophe. From the fact that the mathematical conception of things inevitably participates in the schematic and discontinuous character of number, it neglects, in the immense tissue of nature, all that consists of pure continuity and of relations subtly kept in balance. Now, continuity and equilibrium exist before discontinuity and before crisis. They are more real than these latter and incomparably more precious.